As long as I can hear you. <laughs> it means that um, actually the will is that we find out something unwholesome, much more than the wholesome thing when we practice it. So, I mean, the, my question is how can we know that we go into the right way and we progressing, we get the reason to consider which way is the best for, for us? Thank you. So mm, very good question. So, uh, uh, People often ask this, um, and uh, I think the, uh, there's a, a few uh, responses that I think are useful. Uh, when uh, Lumpo Cha was asked this question, uh, as far as I'm aware, he would often say, it's very difficult to know. Yeah, that uh, sometimes what we think are signs of progress are, are actually signs of us um, uh, heading... Uh, uh, heading purposefully down the wrong track. Yeah. <laughs> so we can think, oh, this is a good result, but uh, we can actually be making more, more trouble for ourselves. Um, so that I feel that the one, re one reliable um, measure is that of uh, dukkha and ending dukkha. You know, that the, uh, even if um, the, the, the uh, effort of meditation is quite challenging, or we, a lot of difficult things come up in the mind. Uh, as sometimes the practice is, uh, it is a painful practice, but it has good results. Um, and they can come quickly or slowly, but the, the practice can be quite painful because of challenging things coming up. So the, uh, I would say that the, um, the, the best measure is uh, is the experience of, of dukkha, kwam uh, diminishing in our life generally, or is it increasing? Um, uh, again, it, it's it can be difficult to, to tell. Uh, I'll give a little example in a moment. But um, uh, what Lumpur Cha would often say, just, just uh, pr uh, if practice is difficult, practice. If practice is easy, keep practicing. <laughs> if you see the results, uh, keep practicing. If you don't see the results, keep practicing. <laughs> That uh, it don't, uh, not to be fooled by superficial impressions is very important. Because he would f tend to focus on building paramita and his languaging of things, but sang barami, sang barami, um, rather than talking about reaching particular stages of meditation. Or people say, "Oh, Lumpo, what stage have I reached? What what level of insight have I reached? Or have I made it to sotabana yet? Or is the second jhana, third jhana?" He often he would say, don't, don't think in those terms, it's, it's not helpful. Because it's not as though those, th those um, qualities uh, are not real, but the mind can attach to the idea of them, or kind of can, we can misread what is valuable. So that, uh, he, uh, and I felt that was quite a help, because I, I was quite an achievement-oriented person. You know, I like winning prizes and and passing exams and and uh, beating the other team, you know, like, <laughs> uh, and that uh, quite my mind quite conditioned to to achieve. So Lumpur Cha's emphasis on you know don't don't think in those ways of achieving goals or or reaching particular levels or, uh, but just make the effort to build barami and then don't worry about the result. And so I felt something felt very very confident. Oh, that's a good way to go. <laughs> Um, uh, so, for example, many years ago, I was leading a meditation retreat, and one of the people uh, on the retreat was she'd been practicing Buddhist meditation for many years, and she was an administrator in a, a big psychiatric hospital. So she had a very stressful job, and she uh, had mentioned that the, 
often the hospital staff were often more challenging than the patients in the psychiatric hospital. <laughs> Dealing with the the other the doctors and the, and the hospital staff were, was more problematic. So, um, but during this medit this retreat, I've been uh, emphasizing uh, a, a, a kind of medita uh, metta bhavana meditation on loving kindness, um, and uh, using the the focus on the on the heart to to, uh, to develop metta. And so three or four days into the retreat, there was an interview time, and she said, with a big smile, I'm very angry with you. <laughs> well, interesting. She said she's very angry, but she's smiling at me. And uh, she said, um, so I've been meditating for years, and I've developed you know, really good samadhi, and I could uh, have this uh, busy day, uh, with, uh, at the hospital, doing my, my job, very stressful. Could come back home, go into my meditation room, psh, everything shuts down. I got this nice, beautiful, bright inner space, and I would sit there. Mm. <laughs> so you've ruined that. I thought, oh really? <laughs> Again, she was kind of smiling, and she said, "Yes, it's like it's like I had this this really beautiful attic space." Everything is filled with light, lots of skylights, and everything is clean and white and bright and pure. And, uh, and I got used to spending my time up in this beautiful, bright attic. And I've suddenly found out there's chaos going on in the rest of the house. You know, the, <laughs> the, 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 the kids have been causing mayhem in the rest of the house. And I haven't been noticing because I've been up in my attic. And it was, I thought it was a, a very skillful way. She, she had developed really good samadhi and a way of just shutting everything else out. And so her samadhi had been progressing, but at the expense of dealing with lots of unfinished business in her jitta, in her, in her heart, in her life. So I thought it was a kind of interesting image of the beautiful, clean, tidy, bright attic space. And meanwhile, the, the teenagers are going, going wild in the <laughs> causing chaos in the rest of the house. And so she said, now I've got to deal with, I've got to deal with what's been going on in the rest of the house while I've been up in the attic. So she was kind of, kind of annoyed but kind of happy to not realize, wow, I was, doing, I was going very um, purposefully down a, a, the wrong track. So she was progressing in one respect but also missing a lot of unfinished business and useful work that needed to be attended to in her life. So um, uh, that was a long time ago. It was about 30, 30 plus years ago that I had that conversation. <laughs> so, but it, it's really stuck with me. So uh, in terms of progress, I feel that that advice of Lumpur Chah, I don't think too much about that. But you can, one way we can measure things in terms of developing Barami is if you look back 5, 10, 15 years, and you think, okay, how did I handle being praised, or be things being successful. Did I get carried away on that? Did I get really excited and like, oh, I'm so happy that you know, people love me, this is great. Or how did you handle being criticized or things failing? Like, oh, this is terrible, they hate me, this is awful. And uh, they're stupid, they're horrible people, they don't like me. <laughs> and, and how is that today? You know, so if we look back and see how do we how do we relate to sickness and health? How do we relate to praise and criticism, gain and loss? And the, one of the signs of genuinely building paramita is the way the mind relates to those what they call the lokya dhamma or the loka dhamma, worldly conditions, and that the more parami that is developed in 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 this life, then the more even. The mind is being praised, being criticized, gaining, losing, succeeding, failing, comfort, discomfort, health, sickness. There's a, a great evenness, kwam uh, in in that. So uh, I feel that's a, um, a good measure. Uh, and and that maybe the last example to give is uh, what the, the Lord Buddha said when somebody asked him the same question. He said, it's very hard to tell day to day what kind of improvement is being made. But he said, like a carpenter, if a carpenter gets a new tool, like a saw or an adze, uh, they can't tell how much of the handle is worn away each day. But after five, ten years of using the saw every day, then the fingerprints are there in the handle of, of the saw because they've been using it 
all the time. They can't say exactly how much has been worn away, but after time, then the imprint of their fingers and their thumb is right there in the handle. So it's a similar uh, way of measuring, just using a span of time, five, year, five years, ten years. And, and if you look back and you realize, actually, I'm really fussy, I'm... <laughs> I'm reactive, I'm cranky, I'm I'm opinionated. Oh, I think I've been going in the wrong direction. So that's good to know. Uh, if that's the case, then to be honest about that and realize, oh, before I was practicing Buddhism, I was a much nicer person. Oh. Hmm. And, pe and a few people have told me that. So, you know, uh, oh, okay, that's, uh, this is not a good sign. Okay, what, what am I getting wrong? So... I would say the other part of that assessment or genuine assessing is your trustworthy friends or people whose judgment you respect. Uh, and if they say, oh, you're, you're so much uh, more easy to live with nowadays, you go, really? <laughs> say, oh, yes. So then take that as a good sign. You know, that, uh, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, I would say, important not to be um, focusing on those... Uh, those benchmarks, uh, Lumpur Cha de-emphasized that and to just keep working and let the development take care of itself. So, please, any other questions? Yeah. Question. Um, so, so for example, the right aspect, so when I catch or realize there is an unwholesome mental state or chattering mind, should I just watch, acknowledge, just be aware or mindful of its existence due to its condition, trust the awareness that it will dissolve away itself, or should I put in the effort to stop it immediately using opposite factors such as loving kindness for ill will, the two parts of the body, or sensual desire, and don't let it keep proliferating? Which Is that your question or a question off the phone? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, the the four factors of right effort, samavayama, called the also called the four samapadanas, the four right strivings, and uh, and I would emphasize that uh, the right effort, samavayamo, uh, it doesn't have to be based on self view at all. So we might phrase it in terms of, oh, my my, my mind is filled, my mind is really chattering, I'm thinking a lot. You know, we might put it in terms of self-view, my mind, or I am thinking a lot, or I'm... Uh, but uh, in terms of right effort, the, the, the summa, the rightness of right effort, uh, it depends a lot on uh, that effort not being based on I and me and mine, not based on self-view, but rather based on mindfulness and wisdom, satipanya. So, so the four aspects of, of samavayama, right effort, or the four samapadanas, uh, restraining the unwholesome from arising, um, so sangvara, restraining. If, it, if unwholesome things have arisen, then to let them go. Um, uh, then to consciously cultivate the wholesome, uh, bhavana, and then whatever wholesome qualities have arisen, to, to protect them, to, to maintain them. So if, uh, um, if there are unwholesome things that have arisen, like, uh, like the, the mind is sort of getting lost in chattering thoughts, then the appropriate effort is to let go. If they, um, uh, and so the, that, uh, or at least to change the attitude towards those thoughts, to, to not be believing in them or, or taking their content seriously. So just to, to change the way that we relate to our thinking, just to, so that if the thoughts are going on and on, and, the, and just the effort to let them go <laughs> doesn't stop them arising, then there can be a change of attitude towards them. So that, just like we've got a lot of bird song here, you can, uh, you, we don't know, what, I don't know what the birds are saying. They're probably making very meaningful statements to each other, but I as a human do not know what they're saying. And so we can change the attitude towards our thoughts. It's just, it's just like the, the sound of the birds. It's just... Just gag, 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 whoop, 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 whoop. It, we don't have to pay attention to the content of our thoughts. It's just the, the chattering of the birds. That, uh, and so that uh, one of the 
the problems of, of a, it's a very verbal, very conceptual society and our education system makes us believe in the contents of our thoughts. Even if our thoughts today contradict our thoughts of six months ago or last week, uh, we believe our thoughts were true then and we believe they're true now. We keep taking them to be valuable statements of reality. But mostly, our th I would say, roughly, well, finger in the wind, 95% of our thoughts are just uh, replaying uh, conversations, um, old memories, uh, movies we've seen, conversations that we've had, books that we've read, the tunes that we've heard. So 95% of our thoughts are really uh, of no value whatsoever. Maybe 5% are actually sort of useful and relevant to doing something practical and beneficial. <laughs> so a rough measure. Um, so that uh, changing the attitude towards our thinking and just dropping that in, like using that as a reflection on our thought, or this is just the chattering of the birds, or um, you know, there, there it goes again, or <laughs> this is a busy one. And so then there's a, a, letting, a conscious letting go of the content of the, the flow of thoughts, and just to, um, <clears throat> just to uh, say, disentangle the attention from that, or this is the sound of the worrying mind, or this is the, this is the planning mind doing its thing, that's all. So there's a, a uh, even if the, the sound is going on, just like the sound of the fans or the sound of the birds, it's just a sound, we don't have to make any, uh, give it any meaning or any value. So people often forget thought, in Buddhist psychology, thinking is just another sense object. Like the eyes perceive light, the ears perceive sound, the mind perceives thought. So just as, um, so you can say, well, what does the, the paint on this ceiling mean? It doesn't mean anything, it's just paint. It's just the kind of whitish paint, that's all. What, what, do the floorboards, what are the floorboards saying to us? nothing they just they're just floorboards but we see them we can see the patterns of colors in them we can see the the color of the ceiling we perceive it but it doesn't have any meaning there's no message there so our thoughts similarly it's like why should they mean anything it's just like a, a shape a sound a form we don't have to give it a lot of value but culturally uh, through our education and our conditioning we give th thought huge value we assume that our, our, you know, our thoughts are true and are meaningful and that they are ours. <laughs> so, so that they're, I would say that they're, they're, they're mostly not tr true, usually not meaningful and definitely not ours, really. Mm -hmm. So that changes the perspective on the, the realm of thought. So just like we, we hear a sound of a vehicle passing by or a bird in the trees or we see the color of a carpet or the ceiling or the walls or the, f the floor. It's just, it's just a color, it's just a shape, just a sound. Don't have to make anything of it. So changing the attitude towards our thinking is uh, also a very helpful tool. So we don't have to make the mind go quiet in order to be peaceful. Like We don't have to, to, be, to shut our eyes or block our ears up in order to be peaceful. No, we don't have to make the body numb in order to be peaceful. So that the thought can be there, just like sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, feelings of the body, they can be there, but if the mind doesn't make anything of them, that the presence of that sense object doesn't have to uh, interrupt the peace of the mind. Yes? Ajahn, I think I read somewhere that Mampo uh, Chas says something along the lines of if you haven't cried profusely, or if you haven't wept, Lot, you to uh, three times it was uh, I think the uh, rather than a lot so if you haven't that's what I remember <laughs> only three times <laughs> so maybe you're ahead of the game already <laughs> so to you have to to seriously weep three times before. Okay, it's not too bad, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well or, or uh, it's easier than you thought. So, the yeah, because uh, the in the the forest tradition, one of the um, the kind of key principles is it, the the practice is known as the suffering that leads to the end of suffering. So that you're deliberately using 
the physical challenge, particularly the physical challenges of li you know, living in the forest or living very, very simply, to uh, uh, what are called the dutangas, the, the austere practices, uh, you're, d you're using those deliberately to challenge your habits of, of seeking comfort and convenience um, so that it, we're not into self-torture. It's not like kind of a masochistic um, effort. It might seem like that sometimes. How long can we have to sit here for? <laughs> when's he gonna when's he gonna ring the bell? He loves to he loves to torture me. Yeah. That we can feel that. But it's the the suffering that leads to the end of suffering, it's a deliberate a conscious challenging of the the those deeply rooted instincts. So that um in the in the 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 thirteen Dutanga practices that uh, sort of uh, the Buddha allowed that the, uh, are sort of the kind of uh, framework for a lot of our style of, of practice. They're, they're all aimed at very instinctual aspects of the mind. Food, sleep, physical comfort, personal space. They're all reptile brain territory. <laughs> so like taking a, a, taking a, a, making a resolution just to eat one meal a day or just to have all your food in one bowl. Uh, to not accept food outside of that that one meal, so that you then other people around you might be might be snacking and they're like, oh, I've made my made my resolution, my aditana, <laughs> and so at that moment, you know, you don't really need any extra food, but everyone around you is chomping merrily away, and so that you're receiving a signal, um, and then at that but that moment, you can know, oh, this is the feeling of I want some food, feeling. But you know you don't really need it, and you can recognise that instinctual urge for, like me too, I want food, kind of urge, or the uh, just uh, living under the uh, living at the root of a tree, just camping out, not using a building to stay in, or not lying down to sleep, that kind of thing. So that you're you're challenging these sort of reptile brain uh, functions, and so that. Um, you know, it is more suffering in some respects, like dealing with comfort you know, or sleepiness or hunger. Um, but the Buddha didn't allow us to physically damage ourselves at all. <laughs> That's not permissible in the, in the, in the uh, and that the, um, the, the challenges are to go against those instinctual urges. And the result, the point of it, is a greater adaptability, a greater simplicity, so that you are um, f you're deliberately frustrating <laughs> those urges, or those, um, and so maybe that's what causes the tears to flow. But you know, I want some. You know, me too. Uh, the, and that that uh, is the result of frustrating or challenging those those habits, as the kind of worldly refuges that we take, and that. Um, but it, it's uh, if that. There's a skillful attitude towards that. Then you know, oh, this is the, this is the result. There's that desire, and it's not being fed. And here's the result of it. it. It's this feeling of discomfort or hunger or sleepiness and dullness. And but in itself, the mind doesn't have to make a problem out of this. It's just a, it's just this feeling, just this this, sen this sensation. Like I was saying earlier in the day, that if the mind can just know this as a feeling, as a, just the Vedana, and it doesn't cross that bridge into Tanha, like I've got to get away from this, or how can I make an excuse to, <laughs> to not, uh, not have to deal with this? Um, then if it, just with the feeling itself, then that um, is very uh, liberating, it's transformative, that we develop a great, quali a great deal of uh, robustness. We're adaptable to different situations if we have if we have a place of our own okay we have no place of our own okay if we have a place to sleep okay if we don't have a place to sleep okay <laughs> if you have food okay if we don't have any food okay so we we uh, cultivate a quality of independence and what the, the it's called the independence of reliance you don't need other people you don't need particular physical conditions in order to find that quality of peacefulness and, and contentment happiness Yes, one at the back there, please. I tend to identify with, uh, I mean, it's a question about Anatta, 
identify with the one that makes a decision. Just what you, uh, one of your earlier discourses where you said, okay, you just, when you feel discomfortable, uh, uncomfortable sitting, you want to move, just don't move, just observe it and watch it. But eventually you move. There's this, this moment of decision making, of volition, of that, which part of the mind uh, operates there? A very good question. So when, when we're developing that insight into not self, the vipassana meditation, you know, first of all, it might be that we that there's a, there's a sense of I'm hearing the sounds of the birds, or yeah, I'm experiencing the feelings of the body. So first of all, recognizing perceptions. All those sounds don't have an owner. It's just hearing. Oh, that's not me or mine. It's just hearing. And then sensations of the body, a little bit more, kind of um, uh, uh, seem more personal. Oh, but actually, also, along with like hearing the birds, uh, that hearing is is not self. It's not me hearing. It's just hearing. That the sensations of the body. We say, oh, it's my body is aching. But, oh no, there's just the experience of aching. Oh, so that's another layer further in. So then, beyond sensation, then. Uh, thinking, I would say, the, the thoughts, the recognizing your thoughts arising and passing away, that, oh, I'm thinking, oh no, actually, there's just thoughts arise and pass away. So that's another layer in. Then we get to emotion, like, you know, I, you know, I'm excited, I'm inspired, or, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm upset, you know, I'm sad. So emotions uh, can see, seem, uh, uh, even if we can let go of, of uh, perceptions, feelings, thoughts, then emotions can seem really like who and what we are, but again, if they're investigated and explored, then even you know, emotions like you know, happiness, regret, uh, jealousy, fear, excitement, anger, um, uh, and so on and so forth, that the, the whole range of emotions, if they're explored, it can be recognized, oh, this isn't who and what I am either. You know, emotions also uh, are not self, they're not who and what we are, they're, they're not a self, they don't belong to a self. But then we get to decisions <laughs> and uh, intentions, and that at least in, in uh, the investigations, uh, uh, that that can really seem like well, there's definitely somebody somebody deciding, and the laws of most countries around the world uh, and most societies say this person decided to do this, <laughs> and uh, and there's a, a good result or a bad result. This is a this is in accordance with the law. This is against the law. They chose. They are to blame. They should be punished. Or this person you know, made this this act. They did this work. Uh, they chose to do this this good act. They should be rewarded. They should be applauded. So it really seems like, even though uh, perceptions, feelings, thoughts, and emotions might be not self, it can really feel like that there's a there is a decision maker here, and the and uh, the cultures around the world seem to support that. Well, um, but. <laughs> If uh, in that process of, of insight practice there's an exploring, if you dismantle or deconstruct the decision, you know, every single element of a, of a choice, there, uh, there is no, uh, there still is, there's no, there's no self necessarily involved. There's the per perception of a situation, there's uh, perception is not self, sanya anatta, there's the memory of how. It might have been handled in the past, successfully or unsuccessfully. So memory, uh, sankara anicca, sankara anatta, um, and the uh, also sankara as volitional formations. There also sankara anatta, sankara, you know that volitions are not self. So it can really seem like there's a me deciding a memory of okay, this worked in the past, this led to a good result, and then the uh, the intention to act upon. That, that memory uh, and that assessing of a situation that can seem like a, a me who's choosing, but if it's really looked at, it's just, oh, the, the memory being this, then a certain option comes into the mind as looking like a, a good way forward. And then the action gets taken following that. And if, again, if it's really looked at closely, it's being mindful of that possibility, being mindful of the, the good result that that had in the past, then there's a, a following of that, of that, that, uh, uh, that track. So 
uh, and then looking at the results of that, okay, th that choice having been made, that uh, uh, having gone down that track, what's the result of that? And again, say, oh yeah, this this is a pleasant result, this is beneficial, this is good, or this is destructive, or this is gratifying but not wholesome, or this is, or this is seemed uh, like a good choice but it's got a painful result, okay. So if we deconstruct the, uh, a decision and look at it closely, then all the way along, each element of it is, is not a person, doesn't belong to a person. But it can really look like that from the outside. So, but uh, don't, don't believe my words. <laughs> but th this is something that, that can be explored. And so when giving their guidance in the meditation, uh, and also what I was saying about right effort, that that samavayamo, right effort, also uh, I like to emphasize that the... Um, so the second factor of the Eightfold Path, Sama Sankapo, right intention or right resolution, that, that is also really uh, uh, important that it's seen that, that the mind can, can set a direction, can, uh, can have a, a, um, an intention or, or a, uh, a resolution without any sense of self. Otherwise, Sama Sankapo couldn't be a factor of the Eightfold Path. He, he, all of the factors of the Eightfold Path lead towards liberation. All of them are completely free of self and what belongs to a self. So there has to be a way that direction can be set and action can be taken that is completely free of self-view and conceit, that, that leads to, uh, that is totally in accordance with Dhamma and, and leads to, to peace and liberation. Otherwise, you couldn't have Sama Sankapo or Sama Vayama. They couldn't be aspects of the Eightfold Path, let alone right speech, right action, right livelihood. <laughs> so, I feel it's important to contemplate that, even though it really feels like I am setting a direction, I am making a choice. This is, you know, I, I am making, I am choosing that direction to go, that to, um, uh, instead to, to recognize that if the heart is really attuned to the time, the place, the situation, then what guides action and direction is mindfulness and wisdom. It's not a, a, an I or a me or a mine. And a, there's a, a categorical difference uh, in those, those two. Uh, and so that's why in the meditation guidance this morning I was talking about it being a self-adjusting system and that awareness is the, is the balancing or the integrative agent. That's the the quality that uh, that uh, brings about balance and uh, attunement. So, like, if we if we uh, say uh, if we take the the Buddha as symbolic of awareness, it's like if the if the Buddha walks into the room, then your mind dwelling on busyness, uh, dullness, or or unwholesomeness. Yeah, if the Buddha walks into the room, immediately you wake up. <laughs> <laughs> as a letting go of distracted thought and any kind of anything unwholesome it's like oh the buddha just walk, walked into the room okay wake up drop everything be you know, be alert so uh, that taking uh, uh, taking refuge or applying the qualities of mindfulness and wisdom it, in a way it's like the if you let the buddha walk into the room of your jitta <laughs> that awakeful aware quality and when we take refuge in the buddha buddhang saranangachami Effectively, that's uh, inv inviting the Buddha to into the room of our of our citta, our heart, our life. And then, if we are taking refuge in in awareness, in wakefulness, then the result of that is that uh, this life can be guided by mindfulness and wisdom, rather than I and me and mine. So that's why I like to use that uh, that kind of expression. It's a self-adjusting universe, or it's a self-adjusting system. And that the more awake and aware that the, the heart is, then the more our life uh, is fully attuned to the time, the place, the situation. So I feel Lumpur Cha was, a, was an extraordinary... I couldn't understand the language, you know, I fully admit that. But the way he handled groups of people and the way you couldn't predict how he would respond, it was like he never had a plan. But he was extraordinarily attuned to everyone that was around, and so that he would, uh, you know, uh, he was um, very responsive to the situation, and he didn't mind being inconsistent. So that uh, if <coughs> that 
he might be sort of very very friendly and cheerful in 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 speaking to one person, and then the next the person sitting next to them he might be quite blunt and harsh and say, so, "Oh, he wasn't very nice to her." And <laughs> But, uh, you know, you could see he was sort of reading the person's tone of voice or their body language or the the way they were responding. And he know oh, this one needs a bit of comfort and uh, and this one needs to calm down and be less of an important person. And, and he wasn't thinking it through. Just a little example um, uh, in the last couple of minutes. So my last conversation with Lumpur Cha... Um, then uh, I had just got news. My father had had a heart attack. I was off living in a little branch monastery up in Royette, Royette uh, province. Just to the Royette means 101. It's 101 miles from Ubon, so it's called 101 town. <laughs> Royette. Uh, so I was living in this little branch monastery up there. I got a telegram saying that my my father was very ill and found out he'd had a heart attack. So I scooted down to Wapapong and to, took. I paid respects to Lumpur Cha and asked if I could have permission to go to England as quickly as possible. And so then uh, uh, I had this conversation with him and Ajahn Jagaro, who is an Australian bhikkhu who started the Bodhinyana Monastery in Perth um, way back when. So he, he was translating and <laughs> he's got a very matter-of-fact kind of um, uh, tone in his voice. He was a, he was a, uh, a scientist before he was a monk. He was a, he was a professional chemist. Yeah. And he says, well, and after Ajahn Chah had spoken for about 20 minutes, he said, well, Lumpur said four things. He said, go to England, um, take care of your business with your family, go and pay, pay respects to Ajahn Sumedho and come back to Thailand immediately. <laughs> Second thing, go to England, take care of your business with your family, go and pay respects to Ajahn Sumedho, stay with him for a year and then come back to Thailand. Go to England, take care of your business with your family, go and, pay, go and see Ajahn Sumedho, pay respects to him, um, and stay with him uh, as, as long as you can. Uh, but if it's really difficult and, and you can't handle it, then, then you can come back to Thailand if you have to. That's the third one. Fourth one, go to England, take care of your business with your family, pay respects to Ajahn Sumedho, and stay with him and don't come back. And it was all delivered in exactly the same tone. It's like, here are your instructions, follow them to the letter. Completely inconsistent, you know, each four, each of the four, inconsistent with the others. And like, okay, off you go. That's your instructions. Follow, follow them to the letter. <laughs> so, so basically, you figure it out. <laughs> And it was, uh, he didn't, there was no kind of apology. Oh, sorry, what I said earlier doesn't, you know, actually, you know, you know, D would be better than A. It's like, no, each one was exactly delivered with, this is what you should do, this is my instruction, you know, follow it to the letter. And completely inconsistent. And he was <coughs> utterly unbothered by the fact that he was contradicting himself, you know, four times over. No problem. <laughs> and so that was the kind of, um, just being with a situation and totally comfortable with with um uh you know the uh, uh the the time the place the situation offering what he could and then leaving it for people to work on themselves so that kind of uh lack of construction that kind of a plan and just letting his his words his actions just be guided by that attunement of the to the present that was really his style so so, speaking of attunement to the present, it's, it's uh, one minute past five, so we can draw things to a close for today.